Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We start hearing number 12 of the 181 period of sessions of the Inter-America Commission on Human Rights. It is called Protection of People in Human Mobility in the US, Mexico, and the North of Central America. My name is Julissa Mantilla Falcon. I'm the first Vice President of the Inter-American Commission and Rapporteur for Migrants. Uh, right now, I have Commissioner Flavia Piovesan, Second Vice President and Commissioner for the LGTBI people, Esmeralda Rosemena, Rapporteur for Children, and Commissioner Margaret May, my colleague, Rapporteur for the Rights of Women. Likewise, we have the Executive Secretariat, Dinah Renault, with us today. This hearing was called by the Inter-American Commission and its goal is to receive information from the organizations that are participating now about the protection of migrant people, people who are refugees, arguing for asylum or with needs for protection, as well as people who are returning to the US, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador. All this information and this hearing will be developed within the framework of the creation of the Southern Regional Report that the Commission is preparing. So first of all, I would like to thank all the organizations that are participating now and a very special gratitude to Mr. Guillermo Fernández Maldonada, the representative of the UN for Human Rights in Mexico. Before I start, um, let me give you some um, advice, some uh, logistics. We will have, there is a tool to check on the time, then we have simultaneous interpreting and captioning, and this is being broadcast live by Facebook um, and YouTube. I will please ask you to switch on your cameras and to switch off your microphones when you're not speaking. In terms of time, we will start by giving the floor to the organizations for 40 minutes. At the beginning of your presentation, please tell us your name and the organization that you belong to. Then we'll give the floor to Mr. Guillermo Fernández Maldonado and then to the commissioners. So we shall start with the first 40 minutes with the participation of the organizations of the civil society. No sé qué organización va a empezar. No, no. There is a problem with the audio there. The audio. Okay, thank you, Amil Karim, for um, yeah switching off your mic and that it was, it was creating the echo. Thank you. So, the organization that will start, who will start? I don't know, which is the organization that will start? Just you can introduce yourselves, open up your mic. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Carlos Perder Morillo, coordinator for Central America of the Association, Inter-American Association of Public Ombudsmen, the IDEF. So if you give me the floor, I'll start. Yes, go ahead. Dear commissioners, and your audience, good afternoon to you all. As coordin regional coordinator for the IDEF, the International Association, I present our concerns about the um, migration crisis that we have in our region. First, I would like to thank the Inter-American Commission for calling to this hearing and for the, giving us this space. The migration has has been the result of the political problems that affect Latin America that increased after the pandemic, the closure of borders, the um, confinement and the isolation and vaccine against COVID especially affect uh, this group of people. The exodus of Venezuelan people that um, go over 5 million people according to the figures is a great amount. The, the whole of Latin America is seeing caravans of people, of migrants. Many people from Nicaragua are going to Costa Rica and there is an increase in the migration in the region from Haiti to Mexico that has 
has has had as a result deportations and, ar and arrests. We've seen the imposition of barriers in order to have access to legal advice, not only in terms of migration, but also to have access to other fundamental human rights that are necessary for these migrating people. According to the official statistics in September 21, seven, 7,172 people were detained and they only had access to human rights. Only 2.7% of the Haiti of the Haiti population that had access to a lawyer by the state, some were denied. This migration has been happening and f f poses great challenges to the migrating populations and to the governments. One of the challenges takes place at the public ombudsman because they need to respond to these vulnerable peoples. Since 2019, with the Euro with a Euro social program, IDEF is working on the design of, of a regional program for the defense of migrants and the creation of a network for legal advice of people that are in human mobility. It has already been implemented. The network will work with focal points in each country and these contacts will address the, the requests and will check documents, will analyze the different powers of attorney, and they will also understand, they will also analyze the jurisdictional requests. This mechanism, this cooperation mechanism will allow for um, greater and faster responses for the people in need. The network will enable us to um, share best practices, problems in having access to justice, and to train the, the officials of the ombudsman that do not have specific services in order to improve their response. The network is open for the participation of other institutions, agencies, civil associations, or natural people that want to protect and foster human rights in, for people that are in human mobility. Likewise, we think we might create more cooperation agreements with other networks or associations in order to work together with our network as long as they are related with this topic as well. Therefore, those of us who are part of the IDEF understand that an agile answer is necessary in order to deal with the vulneration of human rights that people in human mobility uh, are experiencing and in order to provide access to justice for all of them. It is essential to join our efforts in aspects such as early advice, early coaching and the prote international protection and legal advice for all these people. The responses are the only way in which we can face this complex phenomena that go over the borders. The pandemic has also increased all of this. The IDEF is of great, thinks that this initiative is of great importance because of the need to expand the fact that all the protection agencies should, pro should provide more warranties to the people in human mobility. We are at your disposal for any further information that you may need from us. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next organization can take the floor. Okay, in the order that was mentioned before, then I can take the floor now. It is a pleasure for me to talk to you. My name is Amilcar de Jesus Popac. I am a lawyer. I'm a Mayan from the Mayan community. I was chosen um, representative to the parliament from the government of Guatemala and then president or chairman of the Association of Indigenous Peoples from Central America and Central America. I thank you for the opportunity that you are giving us to participate and to be able to address the honorable members of this commission. So as to be able to share with you not only some reflections that are institutional at a regional level, but also to share some efforts that we are conducting and that call for interinstitutional coordination 
as well as a group of regional actions that imply an effort that goes beyond the demands of the civil society and it goes beyond the I mean, fostering any specific policy of one state individually. Therefore, honorable members of the commission, I would like to inform to you that Guatemala and the Central American countries have similarities that we are facing. Impunity, for example, corruption. Unfortunately, as, um, as a member of parliament, unfortunately, I need to say that we are facing all these problems in terms of health, education, and that it brings to more poverty. The Commission of Afro-Defendants and Indigenous Peoples is made up of a group of members that are representatives of the parliament of the whole region. And jointly, we've started a very important process about the rights of migrant people. Favoring the Afro-descendants and indigenous rights, but mainly migrants, migrant people rights. And we are aware of our limitations as a Central American Parliament because of our bylaws. We believed that it was important and necessary to deal with this or to address this opportunity to communicate our concerns to you as well. We would like to tell you that our commission responds to some demands that this year, 2021, some organizations, approximately 28 organizations from Central America, Mexico, the US and Canada who trust our work for con regional control and for proposals for our states in the defense of the most vulnerable people. This alliance of organizations has asked us to start some proposals and some actions among states, among the different states, among the parliaments and among the different the various civil societies to protect migrants, indigenous peoples, and Afro-descendants. We've created the first work, working table or working group with participation of state organizations as well as civil society organizations throughout our region. And we've also invited the, the International Labour Organization with its regional headquarters, the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the UN. And we've managed to get some support that we think that we can share with you so as to reach further agreements. This working group started accompanying the, the ministers that are working on the rights of migrants or migrant workers or that are in transit in our region. Second, I would like to ask the council to start dealing, to start creating a very important challenge in the region that is very important, which is the monitoring and observance of the rights of women, indigenous, indigenous peoples and migrant people, so that year after year, we can have a report about the values and the situation. We've been asking the support for this project by the commission so that under the situation and under the jurisprudence and your possibilities, you can urge our states to join our efforts and to create the necessary institutionality to defend these rights. The proposals are already set at the three levels, civil society, the state and international organizations. That's This is what I would like to share with the commission and we are at your disposal to continue supporting Supporting or sharing information about any other proposal to public policies that will protect the rights of uh, migrants. Thank you. Okay, you can continue taking the floor so you can identify yourselves first. Thank you. My name is Gabriela Oviedo. I'm from the Center for International Justice, CIGIL. And we 
are a network of more than 70 organizations for human rights, representatives and commissioners, all the people that are in human mobility in the US, in Mexico and in the north of the Caribbean are currently experiencing systematic violations of their human rights. They respond to a criminalization of their search for protection aggravated by the southern border of the US. In our intervention, we found representatives of more than 70 networks for human rights that are working daily with people that are in human mobility. Our intervention will talk about violations related to the right to ask for international protection, uh, violations by the state and by non-state agencies. I'm sorry, her, the speaker was frozen. I think her connection dropped. I think we are having a connection problem because we can. Yes, yes, indeed. By the okay, she came back by the authorities. This happens at a, at a time when there is great violence, extreme poverty, and the economic impacts after the pandemic. In order to present the information, I'm going to speak country by country, starting by the South. It is important to point out the policies that have created people that, that have created that people are returned, illegally returned to their countries. Some of them start from the US, some come from Mexico or Guatemala. For example, what they call um, Title 42, which has no grounds for the US government, allows for uh, to ask for asylum, and it has created a chain of people from Mexico to the US. Mexico has expelled these people to Honduras, Honduras or Guatemala. Very recently, the US has started expelling people to Central America and to Haiti. I can say that since March 2020, the US has talked about this Title 42 to do illegal, um, to illegally expel people. It is still one of the rules that is applied to a wide percentage of people. The human impact of this system are devastating and they become worse and worse. Seen from February to October of this year, there were more than 7,000 attacks, including kidnapping and sexual violence against migrant people that were expelled uh, from the US border. Countries such as Mexico or Guatemala have reinforced the militarization of their borders, the use of violence, as well as arbitrary expulsion of people so as not to allow them to migrate. This situation was aggravated in terms of the, the northern countries because they leave these people in very precarious situations and in full vulnerability. Now I'll give the floor to Yolanda Gonzalez so that she can talk about the situation in El Salvador. Honduras, como en El Salvador, esta cadena de devoluciones ilegales ha tenido en las últimas semanas una expresión más de su crueldad, dejando en el absoluto abandono a miles de personas, principalmente en horas de la madrugada. Por ejemplo, en la frontera de punto entre Guatemala y Honduras, situada en el extremo norte del país. Perdón, perdón, Yolanda, disculpe. Yolanda, sí. está con el sí. comisionado Esmeralda. Está sin... Can you hear me now? No estaba en español, está en inglés. Hay que apagar, y si apaga, apaga el, la interpretación. Sí. Yeah. Gracias. Gracias. Sí, no hay Gracias. Eh, qué pena, Yolanda, pero seguimos. No te preocupes. Bye. Por ejemplo, en la frontera de Corinto. So, for example, in the Corinto border between Guatemala and Honduras, on the northern uh, point of the country, up to a few days ago, the civil society organizations have been the only stakeholders present when people expelled got there. And they all got there between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m in buses that belonged to the uh, Institute, the Mexican Institute for Migration. And thousands of people, especially women and children, have arrived to the border in these circumstances, in according to our record, since these persons are never recorded officially and no one accounts for them. Their first needs were to let their countries know they were okay and also food 
bathrooms and transportation. In the case of children, many of them arrive with uh, emotional and health issues. In accordance to the testimonies, most of them came from the US-Mexican border after over 40 hours of uh, traveling by plane and bus. Others were detained in Mexico. These testimonies confirm the chain of abandonment and human rights violations. Families that were interviewed reported that they had been deceived by US agents who made them believe they were going to a shelter. They told us we were going to a shelter and dropped us here. There were people who were really unaware of where they were when they got to Honduras. Also, as citizens of Salvador and Nicaragua were in the bus of uh, Honduras citizens, and they never had the chance, nor in the US or Mexico or Guatemala, to express whether they were in danger in Honduras and if they needed protection. And on the monitoring, we learned about people going back to Guatemala because their life was at stake if they came back home. The same thing occurs in El Salvador, where uh, during the first semester of, the, of this year, almost 10% uh, of uh, those Salvadorians who returned were underage. And El Salvador and Honduras are going through serious institutionality crisis that make this situation even worse. We are also very concerned about the implementation of discretional policies that go against international standards by Honduras with regards to the transit of persons in mobility, in particular citizens from Haiti. Um, migration authorities act by requesting the payment of a fine because of the irregular um, transit or with strong containment uh, strategies, which leads to people being uh, stuck in the border. And they uh, abuse their authority. This was reported by humanitarian organizations. Now I will give the floor to the Guatemalan uh, prosec uh, prosecutor's office for human rights. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jordan Rodas Andrade. I am the human rights prosecutor from Guatemala. Um, honorable Commission, we have been following up in situ the um, deportations of migrants from uh, the US and Mexico. And during the uh, checkups we did in the border with Mexico and Honduras, we realized that migrants were subjected to deportations and express um, expulsions without going to any type of due process when determining the need for protection and their uh, vulnerability conditions as um, part of the principle of non-devolution recognized by human rights standards. We have observed that uh, the mechanisms implemented by these states occurred in a swift manner with no type of advice or information given to these persons that would allow them to defend themselves. We find it very concerning that in the um, this territory, we see people who are expelled and they have the proper uh, documentation that proves that they have um, refugee status or a humanitarian visa. And this is all just based on prejudice and discrimination. These processes are being carried out using places that don't have the minimum conditions to warranty the integrity and safety of migrants. I was able to see that in El Sable, in the border with Mexico. The use of distant borders from the urban centers, the lack of infrastructure for healthcare and security, as well as lack of spaces where people with the need of international protection can access their rights in an agile manner and with confidentiality forces these persons to remain in buses during lengthy trips waiting for a long time to enter both Guatemala and Honduras. 
this situation borders in human and cruel treatment because it's a form of detention without access to any type of services or food until they arrive the place they are transferred to by authorities. These actions may affect more seriously children and migrant women who are um, the great majority of the groups being uh, transported or transferred by the authorities. Now, with regards to the state authorities who over and over again undermine international mechanisms, the countries in the region need to um, use the principle of reciprocity as a tool um, to defend their national citizens. And they used it in transit processes, especially in the US and Mexico, but strengthening the mechanisms to warranty free access to these rights to everyone who may travel to one or to any of our countries. Finally, I would like to say that the rights of migrants cannot be accessible while authorities and security forces continue to see persons as objects from which they can obtain gains. Unfortunately, victims are usually the, sorry, migrants are victims of the abuse of authorities. Their um, access to different services is um, prevented by the police and by security forces and they won't let them go on in their migration route. And of course, this leads to other types of violence. It is because of all of this that a strong pronouncement is necessary that is addressed to the authorities of Guatemala and the region. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jose Castañeda from the uh, Observatory for Human Rights in the Southern Border. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the government of the US has used uh, Article 42 to expel women, men, and migrant families uh, who request international protection. And now they uh, also expel them uh, via plane to the southern border of Mexico with the Mexican collaboration. In the past few months, uh, the US government has sent flights to uh, cities in the south of Mexico and people then are transferred by bus by the authorities of Mexico to expel them without giving them the possibility to request asylum. People say that they have been detained both in Mexico and the US without receiving information about their rights, the legal process and their destination. The imminent reinstallation of the MPP program remain in Mexico confirms the initiative of the Mexican government and allows the uh, violations, the right to request and receive asylum uh, to stay there. So those people who are expelled from the US, we should add those who are detained by the Mexican authorities when they are crossing the country. Both populations are transferred to the southern border and then obliged to uh, cross the southern border to Guatemala, even during the night when it's even riskier. We have even documented the expelling of persons who were accessing uh, the refugee status or have some sort of protection in Mexico or including family members. And these violations in Mexico show that this is a systematic practice and the amount of um, security checks or migration checks in uh, the US, I'm sorry, in Mexico has risen dramatically. And 89,000 people were detained in 2021 alone. Now, this is done in coordination with the National Guard, a military institution that is uh, participating more and more actively in these migration checkups which is, of course, intimidatory for migrants and also for those who promote and defend their rights. With regards to the deportation of Haitians, even though uh, Comart has said that deporting them to their country of origin where their integrity is not ensured, is not possible, Inami expelled 70 people from Villahermosa, including girls and boys 
on September 29, and 129 men from Tapachula on October 6th. All this shows a lack of interinstitutional coordination, and this has consequences on the lives and integrity of persons. And if we add this to the um, power received by the Secretariat for Foreign Relations that has signed treaties with uh, the US and uh, countries in the north of Central America that have not been disclosed. And the legislative and judicial branches are also uh, preventing the um, advancement of the legal processes. So it is important to say that human rights defenders have been harassed by security forces, by the military and security agents private security agents who are appearing more and more in the border and in detention centers. I will now give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Within this context, some organizations have talked to people in El Seibo who have reported to have been pressured by the Mexican authorities at the Villahermosa detention center into signing some documents, possibly of deportation, without knowing what they are signing. They are not allowed to read them. And then they are taken by bus to the Guatemalan frontier or border, and then they are expelled. Many people who requested verbal asylum in uh, Mexico were ignored by the authorities and on multiple occasions, they were expelled in violation to their right to request asylum and the principle of non-devolution. So by um, helping people at these points, we have been trying to uh, get them access and the refugee status, but people are deported only two days after accessing Mexico. We have also been advising persons who have the refugee status who were also expelled to Guatemala. This situation makes it evident that it is necessary to have a coordination by Comar that assesses the uh, migrant groups in Mexico with an intersectional approach so that they will receive uh, protection um, titles like the condition of refugee or statelessness or asylum. And even using the prima facie approach to recognize them as refugees. And this should be done before they are illegally expelled. But for that, Comar needs to overcome its current backload. But uh, authorities deny the uh, information requests on this issue and have not given us additional alternatives to address this migration inflow because the law only addresses family members, sorry, family units or people who have the funds or a job offer. So this all leads most people who do not have legal representation and have not achieved this threshold of universal protection are left without any option. And then they are left without basic um, rights. Now, should the state have the intention to allow these groups to be um, regularized as migrants, people would then face inefficiency by authorities in documentation management, since it is known that at least the INAMI offices in Southern Mexico are working with um, appointments that have waiting periods of six months. During that time, people are in an irregular situation and thus they are unable to access basic rights like food, education, work, or health. Now I will give the floor to Alejandro Seleya. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Xavier Zelaya, the brother of Rafael Alberto Rolling, who was disappeared in 2002 in Mexico. I am a member of the Committee of Family Members of Disappeared Persons in El Salvador. I will talk about the serious violations against migrants and the lack of truth and justice in representation of the families of the region. 
and will also speak on behalf of the Fundación para la Justicia. During the last decades, massacres against migrants have taken place, like the two massacres in San Fernando, Catereyta, and Camargo. To date, there has been no progress in the investigation to learn the truth. There had been no convictions no, uh, or the participation of authorities has not been identified. The pattern of impunity sends a very clear message to those responsible and to the society that they can continue to violate human rights without any sort of consequence or sanction. This year, the massacre of 19 persons in Camargo led to uh, outrage because of how serious that was. But the district attorney refused to investigate the facts until the organizations, through legal remedies, forced them to accept the case. There are no real figures about the amount of migrants who have disappeared. The um, national records of disappeared persons only contemplate 25 migrants but the Argentine team of forensic anthropology has recorded over 1,000 cases by April 3rd, 2020. In 2017, the general law for forced disappearances was passed, and which offered guidelines to search for migrants. But there are transnational mechanisms for the search of these persons there are, pardon, there are no mechanisms that involve the uh, participation of several institutions. As the civil society, we are trying to ask for the creation of a national committee for the search of migrants who have disappeared. We demand the state of Mexico to strengthen the mechanisms of identification and the exchange of persons who have deceased as a forensic commission. We also wanted to facilitate proceedings with other countries in order to facilitate the recognition of migrants. The families who are victims of uh, migrants who have disappeared and were executed demand for truth, justice, support measures, assistance, reparations, non-repetition warranties, and the response for the commission for, of the Commission for Victims has been none. It has been non-existing. The mothers of those migrants who have disappeared are have completely have been left completely abandoned by the institutions. These mothers are dying without an answer, without no type of restitution, and the mechanism for uh, support for the investigation does not have operational guidelines in accordance to the new law of, this, of disappearances, even though there have been, it's been four years since it was passed and people are not even received at consulates because they need to file a report of a crime in Mexico. In 2021, Uh, there was a, a setback in justice for make migrants. Mexico passed a law that means an involution for victims and human rights. The um, district, the state attorney is seeking to reduce responsibilities in the uh, search and investigation. It refuses to open cases and working in a coordinated manner with other institutions. We demand Mexico to adopt efficient, urgent measures with the participation of the families for the search and investigations of these disappearances and executions of migrants, preventing their repetition and creating a special commission to investigate serious violations against migrants. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to my US colleague. Thank you so much. My name is Gerlin Joseph. I am the co-founder and executive director of the Haitian Wood Alliance. We are a black-led Haitian-led organization providing 
support at the US Mexico border. We have all watched what happened last month under the bridge. This is the reality of migrants taking the journey, crossing all of South America, all of Central America in search of protection. As I speak to you today, over 10,000 people have been deported. That includes young women, pregnant women, children, young girls and young boys being sent back to Haiti after the devastating earthquake in addition to the assassination of the president. Addition to years of turmoil, years of political unrest, giving way to mass migration of Haitian nationals. We also know that as of right now, the United States policies have pushed the border all the way down to Panama. Today, the state of Tapachula is a prison state where migrants cannot escape to come to the US-Mexico border to ask for asylum. We can look at all the different ways that people are being mistreated. Extremely vulnerable Black migrants from Haiti, Cameroon, Mauritania, and other majority Black countries, LGBTQ members from, from, uh, from Jamaica, literally being blocked from accessing protection. Title 42 has been used as a ruse to deport, expel, and destroy lives of the people. So therefore, we are asking for all those who are concerned with human rights to come together to ask to put a stop to Title 42, stop deportations, and provide a welcome way so that we can receive people with dignity. I will pass it to my colleague, Zodelia. Good afternoon. My name is Odilia Romero. I am a Zapotec woman, executive director of Comunidades Indígenas and Liderazgo in California. Our organization is currently at the forefront of responding to indigenous human rights crisis uh, facing indigenous people in mobility, including in the United States and Mexico border. We train people who speak their native language to become interpreter. We prov also provide interpreters in hospital detention center and other institutional settings, including responding to more than 400 calls monthly related to indigenous children at the border. We educate institutions like the United States Department of Homeland Security, Los Angeles Police Department and immigrant rights organization about the root causes of migration. As the Kenyan writer, uh, Nugo Wang Chung, says language, any language, it has a dual character. It is both the means of communication and a carrier of culture. Currently at the border, human rights crisis, the use of language and Spanish language with indigenous people is neither fulfilling the role of communication or protection of culture. What it is being used is precisely the opposite. It is to kill any form of communication and culture of the detained children. As we meet to discuss this crisis, which is a result of genocidal policies and impositions of extractive projects. Indigenous Kekchi people are being pushed out of their territories by the CGN Pronico Phoenix, a subsidiary of Solway Mining Company that produces nickel. In Kekchi territory in Alta Verapaz, Baja Verapaz, and Itzabal, Guatemala. There a state of repression has been imposed to the Estado de Sitio declared in El Estor Itzabal as of October 24, 2021. Slowway has displaced and disappeared multiple indigenous communities. We see the impact of Southwest violence against indigenous communities daily as the influx of Kekchi children increases in the US-Mexico border detention center. We see the criminalization of indigenous people at the border as they are risking their lives in hopes to be able to li live. We also see the violation of indigenous human rights with the imposition of the en English and Spanish language on indigenous migrants. As you know, 80% of the detained children are from Guatemala and they're also children from Mexico. It is difficult to know what exact percentage of how many migrants are indigenous from Mexico and Guatemala. The assumption that everyone comes from south of the imposed border speaks Spanish leads to multiple human rights violations. One, the rights are read, in them, are read to them in Spanish, a language they don't speak or understand. This ensures that they don't know they have rights. Two, they cannot communicate the root of causes of migration in their language, which of course limits their access to a possible asylum. 
To address the human rights crisis of the US-Mexican border, the United States and Mexico must do the following. There needs to be an assessment by indigenous organizations to identify what languages are spoken at the detention center. There needs to be access to interpreters in a language access plan from both governments. Information of the right must be given in the different languages at the detention center through video and audio. I will now pass the microphone to my colleague at the Promise Institute. Gracias. Eh, ya están sobre el tiempo. Entonces, como tienen una segunda... Okay, as you are running out of time and you will have a second time for interventions, then you can continue participating in the second round. Therefore, I will give the floor now to the representative of the UN, Guillermo Fernández Maldonado. You have five minutes. Good afternoon. I greet everyone, the commissioners, the vice president, and the, secretary, the executive secretary, and all the people who are joining us in this call today. It is an honor to be here sharing this public hearing with all of you called protection to people in human mobility. I am the representative in Mexico of the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights. I need to read um, a, a paragraph that is, I will give you information not being under oath about people who are in human mobility. None of my comments must be understood as a waiver of the privileges or immunities of the UN in virtue of the Convention of 1946. The work of our offices in the region has enabled us to identify various aspects that were already mentioned and that create great concern in terms of the expulsion of migrants and refugees that not only risk the non-return um, principle, but also the right for due and for to have access to their to different to different possibilities. And in these places, there is great violation of their rights and their uh, security or safety is at risk. I want to point out three situations that we think are essential to adopt measures in order to alleviate the impact of human rights in those people. First, the expulsions or evictions of the U from the US under Title 42. According to the, to the figures, since March, 2020 to the end of August 2021, under Title 21, there are at least 845,000 evictions or expulsions of people from the US. This policy doesn't allow to have access to the, to the request of asylum and or to any protection by the authorities of the US, leaving them in a vacuum, in a legal vacuum, thus enable, enabling them to evict or to push away these people, leaving them in great insecurity. From the Mexican point of view, the capacity of response in the um, hosting or accommodation centers is limited. Therefore, it is important to increase or to improve the institutional answer in order to deal with the humanitarian situation that we have in the borders. Title 42 also addresses the flights from the US to Central America. Since August, there is a follow up for the new situation, the expulsion of people by air to the south of Mexico and to Central America without going through an identification process or any protections or any sanitary or health protocols, thus putting people in greater vulnerability. The expulsions of these people from Haiti and from Nicaragua in the border of Guatemala are also of great concern. Then the return of people with no warranties for the non-return principle and return in dignity and security. Our office has been informed about the return of Haiti people from the border of the US and Mexico to different countries in the region. These expulsions could violate the non-return principle and the uh, prohibition of collective of, or mass expulsions. There are people who were born in Chile and Brazil and they were returned to Haiti. Despite, despite the regularization 
of many people from Haiti between the year 2020 and 2021, and the agreements in order to increase the presence of Haiti people in Mexico, it is important to offer agreements, legal agreements or protection agreements in order to ensure that they will have regular or the typical migration means and not expulsing Haiti citizens without having analyzed their rights um, beforehand. It must be understood that the countries have uh, made agreements in order to ensure a dignified return of people according to human international human rights, as well as to create the conditions to reintegrate the migrants to their origin countries. They've also agreed to increase the flexibility of the migrations in order to respond to the needs of these migrants in a very relevant dialogue between all these people that are in great vulnerability. Those of us are working so that this space can actually create a relevant dialogue among all the stakeholders so that we can take measures and avoid these problems. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Guillermo, for your participation and for the information that you are giving us. Now, I will give the floor to the comments of the Inter-American Commission. So I will ask the second vice president, Mrs. Piovesan, if you have a comment. Thank you, first vice president, and greetings to all the organizations of the civil society. Mr. Guillermo, the representative of the UN, because Thanks for holding this very valuable hearing and for giving us very accurate and very, very concerning information. As I'm a rapporteur for the US and for the LGBT people, I will share two concerns with you. And I will also make a request for information. The first concern is related to the application of migration detentions, expulsion mechanisms, deportation mechanisms, without the due process, the, without ensuring a due process, and they are not paying attention to the non-return principle. I was taking down note of the numbers of the figures that you're giving me, the title 2042, the attacks of so many people in the south border, ten, more than 10,000 deportations, and Mr. Guillermo talked about since March to August, uh, all the people that were impacted by Title 42, how many people had been expel, expelled or expelled from there. And last last week, there was a working meeting, work meeting about the implementation of precautionary measures for a family of migrants. And I heard by the authorities of the US that they rejected the Trump policy of zero tolerance. However, my question is whether you have more information about the disaggregated data of that universe of people that were detained and that were deported or expelled. Who are those people? That's what I mean. Do you have any disaggregated data about them? And what significant changes were between one administration and the other? Because the figures are quite shocking there. We don't have the situation of families being separated or fragmented, but the maximum cruelty situation that still prevails, having parents and children detained, I mean, they're still based on Title 42, and that situation is very serious. Militarization and criminaliza criminalization of the military controls. So that's the first question, whether you have more data about that. And the second question is, the commission adopted two, pr two principles, mainly because of the procedures related to expulsions and also a call for states to take on all the measures that were adopted or addressed in terms of human mobility from the perspective of human rights. 
Therefore, I would like to know if you've seen any best practices in any place because uh, based on the differentiated approaches for protection or if there is a perspective, which is, I mean, it's great to hear about regional networks or public ombudsman offices. So any attempt to make alliances, synergies, cooperation. So I would like to know whether you have in mind any coordination or cooperation uh, examples. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. I will give the floor to Commissioner Esmeralda Losemena. Thank you, Vice President. Greetings to you all. I would like to thank all the information that you've given us from the different organizations of the civil society and the special information given by the Inter-American Parliament or Commission. I would like to start by pointing out that there is a proposal according to the regional model of legal protection. So the data that you're giving us are data that are overwhelming. There is no possibility to, to find this kind of answers in the countries that are concerned, starting from the origin country, the transit country and the destination country, or even the return country. So this regional model, have you been able to identify this regional model as a true, real response possibility? Because I cannot find any other vision or any other answer of a regional or trans-border mechanism or answer that will include or encompass all the problems that each of the countries has to face of all the countries involved here when it comes to assessing all the refoulements. I mean, we have all the information that you're giving us about what these responses represent. And these responses violate all rights. So this, this regional or trans-border commitment And by making a special comment to thank Mr. Guillermo Fernandez, because in like representing the High Commission on Human Rights, this is the call that we need to do in order to get a regional response. I think there is no other way that will enable us to address to address the violations of all rights i mean there's no right that has been taken into account no right has escaped from violation so what can i say about the groups with greater vulnerability i want to ask you something in terms of the term in terms of the data and figures that you've given us about children I, I have information that this group adolescents and children are currently going through or are currently experiencing the greatest challenges in terms of having their rights acknowledged they are being used by organized crime. They are being used in human trafficking, human exploitation. So another question that I wanted to pose to you is whether these protection systems that protect childhood, what or how are they articulated with I mean, with the migration policies, with the migration policies of these countries, because all countries 
need to be declared responsible, accountable from an international point of view in the face of the violation of all these rights. So we are talking about a crisis and the crisis is at this level of crimes against humanity, one of the one of our colleagues was talking about forced disappearances, which are deaths, which are murders, and we don't have any data in that regard. And there is a great number of children that are in this situation. Therefore, I ask you if we could have access to all that information, to this information in greater detail, so that the Inter-American Commission can process from the Special Rapporteurship for Human Mobility together with the, rapporteur, the rest of the rapporteurships that address this topic as well, such as mine, and I know that the rest of my colleagues will address this topic as well, so that we can have information to make a statement about what is happening, what is currently happening in our continent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now give the floor to Margaret May Macaulay. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, I'm not going to be very long um, uh, because I'm sure you want to utilize the time as much as possible. I, I just wanted to sort of say uh, in a very short manner that um, one of the main challenges in relation to human mobility, which is increasing every minute of every day, is in fact the fact that there is no intersectionality between the failure of the home state and the failure of the trans states and the uh, 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 destination states in relation to it. I think there has to be some intersectionality. We have to try to deal with the challenges which cause people to leave their homes, to look for better life elsewhere. In addition to the countries that they go through, protecting them whilst they are in this mobile state. We, I don't think we've ever done that. I, I look back on working on, on women's rights. And I also look through the years of working as the rapporteur on Afro-descendants rights. In addition, women's rights improved greatly in the sense that it was respected through the use of the world conferences which were held which eventually recognize that women's rights are indeed human rights. I think perhaps we have to do so for my um, people in mobility. Perhaps we have to examine this in detail that can be done during world conferences. And then at the end of the day, we end up with a plan of action and a declaration to make states recognize their responsibility. I don't think it has been done by states. Perhaps I am in pain, so therefore I am really, up. I, I don't have much hope. But we have to find a way to get states to recognize the duty. This problem is not going to go away, it's going to increase. So I don't want to take any, any more time off um, than the thing, because we have to get rid of corruption job creations to be created in all the states and all the all the mechanisms have to be used to make life better at all so that less people would want to leave home and we have to work and i am suggesting do you think that we should push for a world conference would that help i think it helps with women's rights and it should help with this so thank you Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Now I will make some comments as a rapporteur for the rights of migrants. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you for your presentation, the information you have provided because of the, the complexity of human rights violations and how migration in some contexts like the ones you are presenting have to do with human rights violations, but also leads to more violations when 
uh, the states don't comply with the measures they have agreed to. So first of all, I would like to say that beyond the particular cases of uh, migrants and refugees, a rapporteurship usually works with persons in mobility. So we would like to have the disaggregated information for cases of human trafficking in particular of women and girls, and also forced displacements and how people can enter a country looking for asylum and they end up being displaced within that, that country. In October last year, we heard from the um, situation of sterilizations and uh, non-consented um, interventions in Irwin, in a migration center in the US, and we would like to know if you have had any information about these invasive cases, uh, practices that were unauthorized. And also, we, we would appreciate whatever information you could give us about forced pregnancies uh, and if they, these persons have access to reproductive health. Another thing has to do with the pandemic and access to health vaccines. Have you had any information about this issue? And in connection to this, um, the issue of xenophobia. And one of our resolutions, and we actually do this all the time, I'm monitoring on the situation of xenophobia, but we would like to know about the information you receive, not only by the state, by, but by the civil society who consider migration a threat. Because we have identified cases where local citizens also uh, develop these practices. And we have also been taking down uh, notes on the cases about disappearances. We think this is very important. This is not the first time we see this. So what's happening with people who migrate in different countries, as Commissioner Arosemena was saying, people who migrate and end up disappearing. These are fundamental issues. We don't have much time, but I'm gonna take two minutes that I will remove from my five minutes I will have in the end. And I would like to ask Tania Renault, our executive secretary, if she has any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. I would like to greet you all and thank you for the monitoring work you do uh, in the different spaces in the civil society, in the different places of the, of the continent. I would like to know if you have any information about unaccompanied boys and girls. At other points, uh, we have received information about children who were unaccompanied, who migrate from Central America to the US. And some of these children, even though they can enter the US, they are detained by ICE. So I would like to know if you have heard uh, what happens to these children once they go through the ICE detention. And then um, I would like to ask Ms. Maria Claudia Pulido if she has any questions. Yes, thank you, Madam President. And for time restraints, I will um, go to my question. As you know, the commission is preparing a report the first a regional report on human mobility from Central America to North America. And it would be very important to learn from you what kind of recommendations you would make addressing these cases in terms of the country of origin, of uh, transit, of destination, and also of return. So what kind of recommendations should the um, commission make Thank you very much. And the special rapporteur uh, for ESCE rights is here. So I would like to know if she has any comments. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. I will be short and sweet. I would like to greet you all. We have been following this um, issue with concern because of the structural causes of human mobility in Central America and Mexico, and also the situation of the ESCE rights of migrants. So I have a specific question about the situation of the SCE rights in these shelters. Um, if you have more information about this, it would be very important, particularly during the pandemic. It, we would like to know about that situation. Have there been any experiences of success? I found it very interesting to listen to the congressman from uh, Central America. 
And finally, I would like to ask about those people who are expelled, for example, citizens from Haiti or Nicaragua. Has there been any follow-up work about what happens to these people once they are expelled? What happens to them when they get back to their country? That I think that is a very concerning topic and I would like to have more information about that. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to the uh, civil society for 24 minutes. Mr. Amilcar, are you requesting the floor? Yes, thank you very much. Um, in, few, in a few words, I would like to thank you for this space. I would like to greet again the commission and the members on the rapporteurs and secretaries. I would like to mention a couple of fundamental ideas. The Central American Parliament is um, and a representation body that includes the Dominican Republic. And we um, issue resolutions urging our states to issue domestic legislation and to comply with uh, international law in human rights. So within that context, it, that's very important because it has been helpful. For example, there was no regulation on a very specific topic, which is migration and the work of uh, temporary uh, workers in the US and Canada. And thanks to our intervention, Guatemala has started issuing uh, regulations so as to prevent extortion and deception um, for those um, people who are deceived when they travel abroad. It is also important to talk about the resolutions of these parliament that we have already been issuing for indigenous peoples, migrations, human rights, which urge our states to develop internal legislations. And now that we mention, we talk about um, experiences of success, I don't know if they were that successful, but they are, they allow us to generate shared common elements because there are no protocols in terms of reporting or uh, in terms of verifying and monitoring. So that is the proposal we're working on at the Central American Parliament. We would like the Council of Ombudsmen to issue a um, process of verification that gather statistical data. Finally, I would like to express, since I am a Mayan indigenous uh, person and decisions by the state of Guatemala as the state of exemption in our region are the wrong decisions that have terrible consequences in terms of forced migration, institutionalized violence and repression. And I wanted to express that we condemn this type of aggression against the civil population and the indigenous people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriela from Sihil. I think uh, you were uh, supposed to continue speaking. No, I will give the floor to Joseph. Thank you, Gabriela. I'm Joseph Bear with the UCLA Commission for Human, for Human Rights. Honorable commissioners, what we've heard here is the product of a punitive and racialized strain of US immigration law and policy that has been externalized to other countries in the region and has activated similar impulses of anti-Black racism coupled with the displacement, erasure, and elimination of indigenous peoples. I'm motivated by some of the comments that the commissioners you've made, um, calling to view this issue as one of intersectionality, uh, to use the anti-discrimination frame as well as the indigenous rights frame to produce normative mechanisms uh, to protect migrants and those who are in human mobility. Um, we have a number of conclusions and recommendations that we're gonna make uh, in a written uh, submission after this. And perhaps our, my colleague from the Washington Office of Latin America can also add some of those uh, recommendations now. But we do think that uh, the call made by uh, Commissioner May McCauley 
to have a world conference can be complemented at leading to some type of declaration on the rights of migrants and the right to human mobility. It could also be complemented by uh, some concrete things that the commission could do, such as creating a permanent mechanism uh, for follow-up to this uh, issue uh, that includes the impacted communities. Thinking of, for example, the generation of the declarations on the rights of indigenous people in both the UN and inter-American context, it was key to have indigenous people's participation in the elaboration of those documents and those normative frameworks. And similarly, uh, the use of uh, experts and members from the impacted communities themselves so that they can put their experience into this process and into this dialogue because it's their human rights horizon that will shape the normative framework coming out of that work. Um, I'll leave it at that and perhaps ask uh, my colleague from the Washington Office of Latin America to summarize other conclusions that our collective group has made and will be presented to you subsequently in a written submission. Thank you. Gracias, Joseph. Stephanie, you, Joseph. Uh, since we have this time, we would like to um, discuss some of the um, conclusions of our coalition and mention four petitions for this commission. As my colleagues have said, we are facing a historic crisis where people in mobility are facing no legal solutions which have been requested sorry which have been restrained uh, they are abandoned in very dangerous areas they are subjected to arbitrary laws that foster discrimination and family uh, separation these practices have led to the death of migrants who were arbitrarily uh, sent back, and this will go on and on. That reality has not changed with the change of administration in the US. And as we have presented with regards to these um, expulsion uh, practices under Title 42, we also mentioned that it's very likely or almost certain that in a couple of weeks, there will be a reset of the uh, Mexican program Quédate, which means to stay home. And in the meantime, the um, expulsion policies have led to a new form of family separations on the Mexican side of the border. So some families, many families make the decision to send their children on their own to go across the border to the US. So the accumulated, the evidence we have accumulated for years shows that there is no law or restraining policy that will put a halt on migration. So uh, re responding to migration on with de detentions and repression only um, makes this humanitarian crisis worse. So apart from the recommendations you will be receiving, we would like to focus on three peti uh, four petitions at a regional level. First, that the commission creates a special follow-up mechanism for the recommendations made about the protection of uh, persons in uh, human mobility in the region, aiming at ensuring a regional follow-up work that checks the serious situation of these persons and the human rights violations we have described. Second, that the commission urges the states in the region, in particular, the governments of the United States, Mexico and Guatemala to seize the expulsion of persons without giving them the possibility to ask for um, asylum. Third, that the commission works with the states in the region and the US in particular to put an end to the practices of the um, eradication of the indigenous identity and to provide interpreters for indigenous persons who require asylum. And also that the commission works with the states in the region and the US in particular to put an end to the practices of racial and intersectional discrimination against 
migrants from uh, Haiti, persons who are Black and Afro-descendants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Again, uh, I did not have much time to address everyone earlier, um, but again, it is an honor to be with each and every one of you today. And as you have heard, people in mobility deserve protection. They deserve dignity. Uh, they are fleeing their home countries due to extreme conditions. I can just point back to the Haitian community who have been victims of extreme, extreme abuse as we all witnessed. And I can say that as black people, black body mobility, there is absolutely no safe place for us. And I will repeat, as black body in mobility, there's absolutely no safe place for us. We have, we, we have, um, had a report prior to the pandemic where we, in, where we interviewed 30 women who made the journey. The thing that they have seen, they have witnessed, they've been raped, they've been mistreated throughout South and Central America, every single country from Colombia to Panama to Venezuela, every single place we have witnessed and heard absolutely no protection for black bodies in mobility. And to date, we see the extreme violence that is unacceptable. As the world stand by and watch and also be a part of both internal violence in Haiti and external violence by the international community. We stand before you today asking for accountability, asking for the international community to stand with and on behalf of the Haitian migrants, with and on behalf of, of all migrants from Cameroon and other countries, as they travel through your countries, we ask for protection, for support, for a way for them to get dignity. It is with a broken heart and saddened, saddened soul that I am addressing all of you today, but my call to action is what we call in Haiti, Apil Meshai Palo, many hands light and load. Understanding that my liberation, my freedom is connected to yours. Our collective freedom and liberation, our collective safety and protection are connected and understand as Haiti was the first country in this hemisphere to freedom and liberation of all people, now we are asking for solidarity. We are asking for everyone to come and uplift and uphold and hold everyone accountable. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you today. We will continue to work hand in hand with you to fight liberation and justice of all migrants. What we said at the Haitian Alliance, we went to the, to the US-Mexico border because we knew they were Haitians. When we arrived, we found people from Guatemala, from Honduras, from Venezuela, from China, from Peru, from all over the world. We went for the Haitians, but we stayed for everyone. And we, we also created the first Black Immigrants Bell Fund to be able to address the cruel immigration system that is imprisoned all migrants to be able to pay a ransom for their lives to be, re to be released. So again, thank you so much for having me and we will continue to move forward in the fight. Merci beaucoup. Bueno, yo voy a intentar eh, contestar algunas de las preguntas eh, elaboradas. Muchas gracias por su atención. Let me try to answer some of the questions. My name is Lorena Cano from the Institute of Women for Migration in Mexico. Unfortunately, we don't have disaggregated data, neither from Mexico nor from the US. So what we have is an approximate total amount after and under Title 42 and the South south border of 114,000 
returns of people. There is a disaggregated data by adults or children. And we have data about 105, 1,574 people that were returned by bus to Central America and 3,950 people of children that were unaccompanied by an adult. In the case of Mexico, we don't have disaggregated data either. We have it by sex and by age. Since January to July in Mexico, there, there were detentions of 117,000 uh, detentions, where 20, 000, uh, around 20,000 were for minor, were minors. Finally, in order to try and answer the issue of women sexual violation, sexual violation, sexual rape, and um, COVID in the Mexican territory, I can say that despite the inconstitutionality between Mexico and the US to send people back, these agreements were not respected. There were pregnant women that were refouled to Mexico. There has not been any any attention given to these women. And there was even the extreme of if these women are not registered in Mexico or in the US, they cannot register their children there. Same thing happens with vaccines. People that have their permanence registered, they can go to get vaccinated. If not, they can they can go to a vaccination place, but there are no clear registers of how many people were rejected in order to, uh, to receive the vaccine. And we don't have the positive uh, access to vaccination either in general terms, like the general data. Now moving, I will give the floor to Eduardo from Guatemala now. Okay, thank you, Eduardo. Yes, I will take the floor just in order to tell you that I address that this is the first time that I see the Central American Parliament participating for the first time. And I think that is very, I mean, it is, I think it is essential for them to address migration issues. They, they don't have binding. Uh, um, sentences but they still but they still have a great weight and it's important not to not to make any organizations become weaker if they are working if they are working on these topics after the economic crisis everything is weaker so i would really like the parlacen to urge the state to commit to comply with all these agreements we are doing a lot of efforts and we would we are very thankful for this international participation and for the commission to participate as well so i just wanted to join everyone in um in thanking you for this space i also want to thank you i'm from uh, the migrants organization i just want to emphasize the importance of the data that you are making reference to and that you are requesting us this lack of register makes the situation more invisible, the situation of these migrants that are being expelled, as we were describing. So if we could observe now, knowing all the official information that we shared with you, the data that Lorena has shared with you about the number of people that were expelled from Mexico or from the rest of the countries, they do not match the records of the Guatemala organizations they are much lower than the actual number of people that are analyzed by the civil society so that implies that there is an invisibility of these figures a lot of minors children under five years old that are living in very precarious situations with their health and security compromised as well as as well as their future same thing as women that do not receive any care and something important as well this care has occurred or has been given only by the organizations the um, ombudsman for human rights has gathered information about the care that these people 
needed mainly in the months of October, September, August, September and October, when a lot of people were refouled um, without any checkup by the Guatemalan government. That's where we received a response and the figures by the organizations. The organizations are the ones that know what these people need, what are their needs as they come back. And I also want to point out that this record that we started uh, conducting from August to October in Guatemala was the result of the pressure that was conducted by the uh, organizations for human rights because it was necessary to get to know the true amount of people and the situation of those people so that the state institutions can respond to that. Unfortunately, the Guatemala authorities have responded as if they were making a favor to them when it's actually their duty, it's actually their obligation, and it was established in international standards, um, the fact of being able to respond in a coordinated manner as they had done, and to allow people to be uh, sent from one place to the other in a in a non-dignified way. So there was coordination there because the um, because there has been security presence to transfer one person from one bus to the other, but with no security for the rights of these people. Therefore, it is important to point out that these records are not just to keep the figures, but they are just but they are to document the needs that these people have and to document the violations that have been conducted throughout this last year. Thank you. And just to wrap up our intervention and so as to give the floor to the IDEF colleagues, I wanted to reinforce the importance of creating a follow-up mechanism for the recommendations that the Commission has given us. In the last few years, we've seen how the refoulement policies and the criminalization of international protection have increased. They continue, they've become deeper, worse. So the origin countries of these people do not have the possibility to provide any kind of care, whether it is social, psychological services to the people that were sent back. And the information that we have is scarce. The organizations of the civil society can barely have access to this information. And to many of them, many of the things that we see are out of the monitorings that take place during the night, nighttime in the borders. All of this makes us understand that there is a need for a mechanism in addition to the reports, to the mechanisms that already exist, because the policies have continued advancing as well. Thank you, Gabriel. And I will give the floor to Juan Carlos Perez Murillo. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the opportunity again that the Commission has given us for the IDEP because our main concern of analyzing the, the crisis of these women and of these people in mobility has fostered us or has encouraged us to think about in which way from the from the public ombudsman offices how we can give a response therefore we are building a regional model for migrants and refugees but the most important thing and i think that this would be the message that is essential is the construction of an inter-american network for the defense of people in mobility because this network would aim at creating dialogue joint work among the entities that are part of IDEP. So what we want by means of this network is to protect access to justice for all these people that are in mobility. And as of this articulation and as of this joint work, we would like to ensure access to justice, that is to say the, the legal representation in the countries where they are, so that by means of our public offices that belong to IDEV, they can seek cooperation and assistance. In that regard, I want to emphasize that I agree with the comments made by Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena, this is a problem that takes place in the whole of the region, so we need coordinated 
response to ensure access to justice for all these people in mobility. And it's precisely what IDEF is looking for by creating this network that was approved now in October 2021. Therefore, I would like to invite, invite all of you, members of the civil society and of different organizations that have taken place in this hearing, to come to this network, to participate in the network of IDEF. As I said before, it is present in almost all countries in Latin America, Central America, Mexico, and some Caribbean countries as well. What would be the point of this? getting better information of the activities that we are conducting in the network and how they can be coordinated. We have already approved um, an action protocol about how the different offices will coordinate the, um, the attention or the services providing provided to the migrants and to the refugees. So just I just wanted to repeat the, um, the invitation. You can check the website for any further information. Thank you. So we need to close this hearing. We are getting uh, um, to the end of, of our available time. I can still see the hand raised of Odilia, but I think you have already finished your participation, right? No, I wanted to answer some of the questions because you said what happened, what happens with the children. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but please 30 seconds. If not, can you send it in writing afterwards? It would be okay. What happens to children after they are detained? They are abandoned in a country where they do not speak the language, they do not know the culture, they cannot have access to school, so they end up being uh, street workers in the streets of the US together with the team, to our team, we will send something more detailed by email. Okay, so now we are at the end of this hearing. We want to thank everyone for your participation. This hearing is part of uh, the preparation of the report that we will make, so your participation and all the information that you can send us in writing is also very important, as well as the recommendations. I want to wrap up by thanking all this work and the work that you do on a daily basis, not only being here. I want to thank the Ombudsman, the IDEF, the, Inter the Central American Parliament, because I think that your participation and working jointly together with what Mrs. Maldonado was saying, this coordination between actors, that is essential. And something else, it seems to be a cliche, but democracy, which is the basis of human rights, is what needs to be defended because a lot of the migrations is happening because of the lack of democracy in the countries. So as we were saying before, sending migrants from one country to the other, that's not solving the problem. It's actually worsening the situation. So in this sense, from the rapporteurship, we want to continue with this with our efforts and in addition in addition to any migration emergencies i mean this is an emergency so we are going to respond according to this thank you again for your presence thank you for your continuous work and we're going to continue working with you enjoy the rest of your afternoon thank you